Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our roundtable. This is Sunday, February 14th, 2016, and our subject is soul. And this morning, um, Florence is going to start with a few things. Go ahead, Florence. Oh, yes, I just wanted to remind everyone, since reminders are what we do here, <laughs> that at the bottom of the unity notices is a section that says additional resources, and one of them is the thoughts on church. And I've been finding it very helpful to read that before, uh, well, several times actually, and not, but especially before our services. If you don't mind t taking a look at that and praying with the suggestions there, I have found them very helpful before you know, coming to our service. Because I think this our service is a healing service, and to come with the right thought, and also it says to pray for the congregation, which I used to forget to do, but it's very important. So, yeah, there's so much on our website. It's good to be familiar with with it, and to browse it, and to to look over it, so you know. And there are there are a lot of helpful suggestions. Sometimes people come in saying they don't know how to watch. Well. There's a lot on our website about watching, how to watch, and of course, the book, Watches Prayers Arguments, which you can download on our website, is invaluable. Was there anything else, Lawrence? Um, no, not in, in terms of the, these notices. No. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so yesterday we had a wonderful Bible study on Asa. And many lessons to learn. If you weren't there, you can listen to the recording. Uh, today we'll get more into the science and health part. And um, I'd like to start with citation two in science and health. Does anyone have it available to read? Yes. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. Now that this is science and health, Jean. Thank you, though. But science oh, I and health. Which, yeah, I'm sorry. Lil, you want to read it? Soul has infinite resources with which to bless mankind, and happiness would be more readily attained and would be more secure in our keeping if sought in soul. Thank you. So my question to you is how do you seek your happiness in soul? See, we have a list of your names, so we will call on you if we have no volunteers. <laughs> By getting to God to establish your relationship with Him, then you find out that all good things come from Him. So it's always asking, Father, what? Father, what do you want for me? Father, what do you want from me? And it's a continuous practice. It's really just connecting to God and, and finding that out all, that all good comes from Him. And the only way to do that, for me anyway, is this continuous connection with Him, asking Him always. It's something that I've learned here, and that's continuing to help me. Thank you, Dede. Yeah, you, you've written some good things on the forum recently, too. I, I think some of that pertain to this, right? To, to, yes. It starts out with, soul has infinite resources. There seems to be so much concern about people having enough for their own well-keeping and happiness or whatever. But if you realize the soul has infinite resources, if you see out in this world one speck of good somewhere, it's a sign that good is present. If good is present, it's available to everyone. After all, God doesn't have any favorites. He doesn't prefer one over another. And if you can acknowledge and just praise God in this way, you'll, you'll find your happiness. And not only that, the happiness will be more secure because it'll be based on God, not on selfish motivations a good point. Infinite resources. And yet, 
when you have a problem, very often your first impulse is to do what? Go to some material. Find a human solution. Mm -hmm. Yes, find a human solution in Florence. Go to some material. Or just worry. <laughs> or just worry. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all of those are wrong answers. <laughs> <laughs> I I love that thought, the infinite resources. Infinite. And imp, it's imp, it is impartial. So that's why, you know, this idea of the haves and have nots is is not according to Christian science, is it? No. Not according to God's law at all, right? <laughs> Right, it's not according to God's law. And therefore, if we can get this to as many people as possible, to know they have infinite resources to turn to in God for everything. That's why Jesus uh, said, uh, don't take any thought for what you need, for, what, for food or for clothing. Because right. your Father knows you have need of all these things. Yes. And he, and he showed that he supplied it when he fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two small fishes. Yes. I, I heard I a, think I, uh, Go ahead. Oh, um, there's been a research, scientific research done on measuring people's happiness, and they found that gratitude plays a vital role. And of course, they didn't need to do the research, but it was interesting that that came up. <laughs> because gratitude does put you in such a a wonderful state of mind that you can't help but be happy when you're grateful. That's exactly true. It's an exact measurement of, um, yes, and that's one of the infinite resources is just being grateful. And one of the, there are oh, plenty of very wealthy people who are ungrateful and miserable. And I think it's important because um, what she said here, even though there, there, there is this deep understanding of internet resources available for everyone, what Mrs. Sadie said, he saw and so And for me, even though we have these resources, it can only say it. If you can, if you see it through God, because in some situations we are people feel dismayed, feel disappointed, feel troubled. But if thought and so, they can actually find happiness even in, at that moment of dismay, even at that moment of trouble. We have seen the examples even in the Bible of. At present time, when people have been in, it, in, in trouble, but yet they seem to be happy. Exactly right. Yeah. Did you all understand him? Yes, no, I did. Well, seeking God right in, in the moments of trouble, you will find him and find your happiness there. And certainly the Bible is full of those experiences. Um, the security also. I mean, it's one thing to be grateful for something, but if you think that uh, you got it by chance or that somebody gave it to you, if you forgot, if you forget that all good gifts come from above, well, then it's not a very secure, you could lose it pretty quickly. Yeah. Good point there, too. So, if you seek God, God's help and are grateful to God for what you have, then it's secure. Then you've got it and nobody can ever take it from you. Yeah, it, it's, that's a hugely important point because many people will say, well, I have been grateful. And maybe they are grateful for the thing, but do they go back to the, the giver, the source? That is where the gratitude has to be, and that's where it remains permanent and secure. You will find your security in that. You won't be worried that you'll lose it, uh, that it'll be taken away from you in some way. 
um, because it's from God and God is ever present. It's impossible to lose good when God is ever present. Betty, were you going to say something? Oh, I, I, you said it way better. I was just going to say something about the hymn that said gratitude is riches and complaint is poverty. And right. I, That's a good one. Full or yeah. half empty. And, and, you know, while people are complaining about what they have or don't have, mostly what they don't have, they, <laughs> they, they could be working on their own, in their own field. And they could be turning to God as an infinite source. But instead, the devil has them tricked to, to complain and to blame or to think that their resources are limited. They're not when they're sought in soul. And many, many people have proven that, haven't they? Coming down coming up from the from the worst poverty level. Is that not true? Yeah. I I hear it all the time. The worst poverty levels, they find their way out. And it's been exactly done through this way. Whether they call themselves a Christian scientist or not, they've turned to God in some way and risen above all the limitations and proven this point, the provable point. What, what are some of the things that Mrs. Eddy says about happiness? Happiness is spiritual, born of truth and love. Thank you. It would Very be more secure. It would be yeah. more if we uh, thought, thought it in soul. Right, that's... that's Happiness is secure when thought, thought in soul. Yes. What are some others? You should know them when you're familiar with textbook. It exists not, but it requires all mankind to share it. Thank you. Thank you. It's unselfish. You can't have happiness and be selfish. It's impossible. And the mortal senses don't recognize it. Yeah, that, that's a good point, too. That I think that goes back to what um, Benjamin was saying. You know, your physical senses don't recognize it, and that you're weighing everything, uh, uh, your material senses. And it would appear, materially speaking, they're the haves and the half-nots. But your spiritual sense tells you something different. And that goes back to to the beginning of what Day Day said in the beginning, uh, making sure you are turning to God for everything, including what you see and how you see it. You, you, you will not judge righteous judgment if you are looking through the lens of materiality. Really, I think... Happiness, you cannot fake it. Yeah, because uh, it's, it's given by God. When you are happy, because it comes from God, you can express it with people because you cannot keep it to yourself, too. Because if you try, you will lose it. People will know when you are happy because people will feel it. People will be blessed by it. Thank you. you. Share it. Thank you. That's the idea of it being unselfish again. And some people have said there's a difference between happiness and joy, and that could be true. The joy being that deep sense that comes from God. Happiness may be more on a superficial level, but... Riding anyway. a roller coaster. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, riding a roller coaster, something like that. Yeah, I think there's a difference. Uh, so. True happiness is joy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to mention a couple of things I read this morning. I was reading about Abijah, who's the father of Asa, who we had in our Bible study yesterday. You know, he was a king whose heart was not with God, but, you know, he did see some of it. Um, and um, when the kingdom of Israel attacked Judah, they were, um, Israel had twice the number of men, and they, 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 fought back against Israel and won and brought peace to the land. So here was a king who um, only had an inkling, you know? Yet that inkling was enough. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention is I was reading about Gideon, who uh, 
we we had him uh, we discussed him not too long ago but you know with 300 men i mean he uh, uh, fought against uh, some enormous number of people but they they said that gideon was he was poor and he was the least in his father's household so we think of these characteristics you know you got a man who's poor the least in his father's household someone who sees god only very um um dimly you might say you know um but they, but they succeeded because they were turning to God. Yeah, and, I, and and you can bet he was pretty happy about that. He and, may not have had much. And it yeah. goes to the to the lesson. In order to apprehend more, we must put into practice what we already know. We must recollect that truth is demonstrable when understood, and that good is not understood until demonstrated, and then a faithful over a few things. So that that is to your point. Maybe they only had an inkling, but they used that inkling. So that's that's where this business of of you know looking at other people. Um, Lillian brought envying. that out. Envying. Lillian brought that out yesterday. We were talking about running the race, and one of the important things is to not to be looking around or judging yourself or comparing yourself to other people. You take what you've been given and use it. And it will grow. And while you're spending all that time being miserable, you could be using that inkling that you have, that God gave you, that you are obviously ungrateful for by not using it. So use that inkling. Look what it did, as Tom just said, for Gideon, for others. Be faithful. So run in and you. Sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, if you're running and you're looking around, you're really delaying yourself. Um, so you are. You, <laughs> can you can trip, too, if you're not like, going. Run into something. That's a dangerous uh, way to run the race. What else does um, Mrs. Eddy say about happiness? It's not science and health. I think it's Help it impress. Did she say that, uh, or did we already mention that a happiness would be more secure if if a thought, thought and soul? Right. Well, that's that's the verse we've been talking about. The statement. This is something different. Okay. She she tells you if. <laughs> If you want to be happy, you have to do what? Very specific. You have to argue on the side of happiness. <laughs> get what you ask for. You get what you ask for. In other words, she's telling you you're not you're not um, handed handed it on a silver platter necessarily. Maybe someone can look that up. Um, and read it. If if you want to be happy, you have to argue on the side of happiness. And why do you have to do that? Why do you have to argue at all? Because error would tell you the opposite. Because the yeah. devil's going to regularly tell you that you're not happy. Isn't a can to Jesus? When the error came to him and tried to argue with him, yeah, he was on the right. Yeah, he spent forty days in the wilderness being tempted, didn't he? Yeah. Well, Jesus had to argue. Yes, that's the example for us. <laughs> right? we, we yeah. Yes, good for him. Yeah. And I forget where, but Mrs. Eddy did say, if you reach the point where you don't have to argue anymore, it's a position you actually have to earn. Precept upon precept, line upon line. It's not like you just step into that position. But uh, evidently she did. You know, she would just walk in and her atmosphere would heal something without any arguing. But that was a very high level, a position earned over many years. Yes. And and it is, you know, there are times when you ha do have to argue. It's very hard. You might have a lot of reasons to feel miserable, <laughs> and you got to argue on that side and, and claim it. This is um, Jesus said, "My joy, what? 
no man can take from me? Yes. Um, yeah, that Lil quoted some, okay. but you, but Linda quoted the, yeah. When Lil said the joy comes comes from the Lord, which is truth, and you, if you've got the Lord, that means you can be joyous. And Linda said, no man can take it from you. And remember that, because don't you sometimes think you'd be having a great day, and then your boss comes in and tells you some crummy thing, and suddenly you lost it. <laughs> so, so some man took your joy from you. But. Yeah, right, because um, I have a um, real-life experience about that. I think um, that was sometime last year. I was coming back from an appointment that I was very happy with the outcome. Just a few blocks away from the place, I was full of joy, and as full of joy can be, driving my car, and I stopped at the light, and there was a driver who wasn't watching. Joe came right and banged right behind me. And I came out, and luckily nothing happened to my car, nothing happened to him. But I knew that it was the devil who wanted to take that joy away from me. And I told the gentleman, just, just go, and we, uh, we went home peacefully, but I, I, that was... An example of that, because when you are happy, uh, the devil is not. Thank you. You know, that's, you a, to, that's an important point. That was one thing, again, Mrs. Evans would teach us if we were ever in something like that. She said, drop it. She said, the one thing it's trying to get to you is take away your Christ consciousness, which would be your joy. It's trying to bring you down, get you all upset. Oh, why this happened so awful? I must have done something terrible, blah, blah, blah. And you go on and on, and pretty soon you're really, <laughs> the next thing you know, you get hit with something else because you're in the soup with it. So anytime anything like that happens, you declare immediately, this can only bless me, this can only do me good. I will not let it take my joy. No man can take my joy. Don't let it take your Christ consciousness there's anything later you can learn from the experience if you let your thought down if there's anything like that fine um, if there's anything else like that learn it but don't let it take your Christ consciousness you protect and defend that with all that you've got now Gary found the quote for me so go ahead it's in uh, Christian healing page 10 line 20 if you wish to be happy Argue with yourself on the side of happiness. Take the side you wish to carry, and be careful not to talk on both sides, or to argue, argue stronger for sorrow than for joy. You are the attorney for the case, and will win or lose according to your plea. So remember, that's a very important point, and it also, it, it goes along with something else. It's in the lesson. I have to make sure I can find it. But she's saying the same thing, that you will, um, the devotion of a thought to an honest achievement makes the achievement possible. Exceptions only confirm this rule, proving that the failure is occasioned by too feeble a belief. Might be something else. Um, anyway, but that there you go. If you if you're weak and thinking, oh, I'm happy. Well, maybe I'm happy, but it was a terrible day. I'm really not so happy. <laughs> you're not gonna be happy. <laughs> you gotta have a little oomph, a little conviction. You know, that's what I was thinking with with Tom and when he give when he does the Bible studies, and all of you do this, but he he talks about. It. He says, I'm so happy to be here. This is gonna be fun, and and I feel that way too. It's gonna be wonderful. So let's let's rejoice and celebrate. Radiate that good. I love the round table. Go ahead. I have a little uh, thing that two inner person says what we're saying. We are saying, and it's from Pope and Press. What if the little rain should say, so small a drop as I, can ne'er refresh a drooping earth? I'll tarry in the sky. Yes, I, I love that too. That's the idea of 
oh, what can I do? I'm so, you know, few, the insignificant, I can't do much. There again, the weak arguments, weak, weak. You know, the full idea of joy is so important. It's actually included in the doctrine of Christian science, where it says that joy cannot be turned into sorrow, for sorrow is not the master of joy. Thank you. Even in the doctrine of Christian science. Thank you. Page 304. And we've quoted Big Dale Young, who says, if you're not having a good time practicing Christian science, you are not practicing Christian science. How can any of your prayers or any of your treatments be good if you're, I'm miserable, but I'll pray to God and help the world. <laughs> I mean, it's not going to work. Yeah, sometimes I feel like the biggest challenge, I mean, in reference to what Gary read, is when the person whining about that, it's not <laughs> you, but you have to put up with that person. Right. I, I think it's a big challenge being able to overcome this situation. So that it doesn't affect your own happiness. Well, yes, it is. And that's where you have to correct it or change the subject or just start exuding about how happy you are. You know, someone was telling me recently how it, no matter what the weather is, people will complain. So just be ready to say how you love it. There's somebody that knows very well. <laughs> name, but she's a very happy person, but because she wanted you to feel or to pamper her or something. <laughs> the first thing her. she <laughs> see in the morning, she started complaining about issues, even though she's not being honest about it. So I think that that would, that would be a big challenge for us because if you know somebody has a habit of that, you prepare yourself before you meet that person because you know what you're going to say. Yeah, and if you don't correct it, it does what? Jump shit gets you over. Yes, and that's true listening to the news and other things that are so negative. you got to make sure you're ready for it, ready to, to know the truth about it, or it will jump you. You get a steady diet of all that stuff, pretty soon you're feeling pretty darn depressed. Oh, can I add, I noticed there's about 160 of points in uh, Mrs. Eddy's writings about joy, happy, and happiness, which I had no idea, so thank you for bringing this up. And I came across another quote, which was interesting, as she says, deception is fatal to happiness. Wow. Deception. Yeah. As you would expect. Yes. Yeah. I found... Uh, uh, yeah. Matt, go ahead. Matthew, Matthew 24, 43 has been helpful. It talks about um, it talks about if it's when the thief, if the owner had, if the owner had an idea, or would have prepared um, that his house was going to be robbed. If he knew it, he would have prepared, and the house wouldn't have been you know, when they have been robbed. <clears throat> so it's kind of the same idea with joy and happiness. If we would guard our thought more, I mean, I wish I could think about that more and have it on my forehead because it's in seconds you can lose your joy and happiness because someone offends you or says something goofy. And then and then there's so much more homework. Now we have to work with offense and, and this and that. So just a simple verse with Matthew 2443, if we would guard our house, our mental house, and know when the thief is going to rob our joy, we would be so prepared, and, and maybe we would be happier longer, and our joy would be with us more. So I like that. It's been very helpful to me. Very good and very true. And, you know, some people will specifically try to bring you down. I mean, that's a terrible thing to say, but it's true. That's malicious. They will try. Or even if you've ever been, you know, you go out in the morning and someone will say, gosh, you don't look very good. Do you feel okay? <laughs> and suddenly you think, hey, maybe I don't feel so good. <laughs> but, but to Lucy's point, if you're prepared, you're not going to fall into that. You're, yeah, I feel great. <laughs> I hope you feel great too. Be prepared. 
that's one thing I've always gone. I've been so grateful for all the literature that we've gotten because um, Eustace on self, where he says, and I, I always think of it, is um, it, it, we should be so on self, so freed of anything that is unlike divine mind. But he said, uh, we should never be disturbed by what someone does or doesn't say does or doesn't do, and I add, what someone may think or may not think. We should be so unfelt um, that we should never be disturbed by the manifestation of, of error. Yes. It's so helpful. I think, I, yeah, I think this is why the, the verse, acquaint now thyself with him and be at peace, has been very helpful because when you said, I sense my thought dropping, okay, where am I, you know, get back to God, and again, that's why only from that source can we have this joy or, or happiness from soul, the more my thought is preoccupied with God or things spiritual, the more joy I have, and there's no two ways about it, I, the other way is either getting into a, a sense of depression or fear or worry or whatever, so... It's all about God. That's it. Thank you. Yes. Only God can give us gladness. Only God can give us peace. That beautiful hymn. And ultimately, the only happiness that any of us can have is if we are fulfilling our purpose here on earth. Um, Mrs. Eddy says this in the message for 1902, page 17. Happiness consists in being and in doing good. Only what God gives and what we give ourselves and others through his tenure confers happiness. Conscious worth satisfies the hungry heart, and nothing else can. That is beautiful. Yeah. And that's the, the ultimate. And that goes back to you cannot be selfish and be happy. And that's really the result of everything everybody has said this morning. Yes. And you find your purpose in God, serving him in an unselfish way. It goes back to what Day-Day says. Find everything in him, asking him all, all the time for his direction. And you will find a sense of joy that's wonderful, unspeakable. It goes to the depth of your being. And you will know instantly, too, when anything tries to interfere with it and you will protect it and defend it. I, I believe it's in Nehemiah that says that your strength is in what? Lord. Well, something before that. Your strength is in the joy of the Lord. Uh, yeah. the Lord is the strength. Yes, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Maybe that's the correct statement. Okay, so so think about it. When you're joyful, do you feel strong? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Certainly more than you're miserable. Worry. Yes. When you're depressed, do you feel strong? No. No, you feel helpless. Totally you do. helpless. Yes, and weak and all of that thing. So think about it. You know, it, for instance, if your body, if your body, oh, I'm so weak, I'm so tired. Ask yourself, have you been expressing joy lately? I guarantee you, you cannot be joyful and feel weak and depressed, and feel weak, weak, ungrateful. They, they go hand in hand. And that's why a merry heart does what? Good for the bones. Like yes, <laughs> good for the make, make it like a medicine. A merry heart make it like a medicine. So when you are in a depressed state of ingratitude and other things, you are doing harm to your body because you're being very, very naughty, 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 disobedient. <laughs> you're not obeying God. Who is telling you to rejoice? Rejoice always. What are, what are those list of things in the Thessalonians? Pray without ceasing. 
In everything, give thanks. Rejoice always. Ephesians. Anyway, it's a list of things, and it, there, it's a wonderful thing. I would say it's a recipe for happiness. <laughs> and it's, it's your divine right for you to be joyful. But a good point made by Benjamin was you cannot fake it. You know what that is. You know, when you're with somebody, it's, oh, it's so nice, I'm so happy, everything's great. <laughs> and it just yeah. turns your stomach. <laughs> what? You want to punch them. You want to punch them, <laughs> right. <laughs> you can't fake it. And then that's an awful thing to do, to fake it. Or if someone is suffering and you say, oh, you're okay, everything's fine, what's the matter with you, I'm so happy. That's terrible. <laughs> Yeah, punch them too. That's not the deep joy and the and the compassion. And when you're really expressing this joy of the Lord, there's no way you could ever do that. So, um, but remember that. Remember that your strength is in 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 the joy and joy in God and what you're doing. So you should wake up in the morning feeling joyful, motivated, all good things because God created you that way. And also, it makes you an overcomer. It, it wins every battle that you that the enemy present before you, because uh, you have no room for error to intrude your thoughts to to bring you down. I remember. Um, the most inspiring, I, mean, I have a lot of stories that inspired me in the Bible, but the one that I always find strength in the Bible is the story of uh, Joseph. He's a very good example of where happiness can take you, how far it can take you, how it can make you a winner on everything. He he was in, in a very rough situation with his with his siblings, but never a moment that he let his joy drop. And with all the hatred that was coming to him, he always approached his siblings with joy, telling them wonderful stories, even though they, they don't want to hear a bit of it. And the devil should try to take his happiness away. Well, I did times. ever. <laughs> One thing after the funny. next. When he was thrown in prison, he was as happy as he can be. And he was a winner at the end. And that was, he was a winner in the end. And that was the joy of the Lord. It wasn't a fake Pollyanna joy. It was a deep knowing of God's presence and power. And also about his, who he was, who Joseph was as his child. He, had, he was on a mission. And uh, nothing could take that joy. And we must have that same uh attitude, that same defense, that him that I love, dark and cheerless is the morn, uncompanioned, Lord by thee. And then it goes on about how once you get God in the picture, that cheerless sense leaves. So Gary's going to read from Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians. Okay, here we are. These are our instructions. <laughs> Rejoice or pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit. Despise not prophesying. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. The very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Beautiful. So when you're ever feeling in trouble, you can turn to that little guideline and, and quiz yourself, are you doing those things? And if you're not, begin to. And as we were taught here, even if at first you don't feel like it, you, you, you get the crank going, you start, you start with it. And, and even though you don't feel like it, you start at it. And pretty soon you will feel it. You will feel it. Because it's, it is, it's God's presence when you do those things. You're finding you're at one minute with him, your consciousness with him. That's what lifts you out of a muddle, whatever that muddle is. 
Yeah, and, and I like to think, you know, when you're arguing on the side of happiness, on the side of right, it's not like you're searching for something that's way out there somewhere. <laughs> what you're doing is you're, you're, you're cleaning the window pane that has been, become really dirty. Because the light is always there. You've been given all these things by God, and you're uncovering the truth. You're uncovering it. You're not making it. Yes. It's already there. It's always been there. But we have to realize it. Yes. Keep your window pane clear. That's why at the end of the day, go over your, your consciousness and ask yourself, have I been with you, Lord, today? Have you been my consciousness? My thought, your thoughts? And, and if so, you will go on to have a, a restful night with his presence and power with you. But keep that slate clean. Don't let it get so filthy that you can't see out of it anymore. It's, it would appear to be harder to deal with it then. The beauty of nature is to me, I mean, as she says, a hieroglyph of deity. I think we're surrounded by beauty in the sky and in all the lovely, lovely nature. We are. That's a constant that, remind, a reminder of God. It is. Um, my experience personally with us, um, I don't know about other people, but every once in a while, the temptation too comes to me. Um, try to take my happiness. And it could be a temptation of want, or the, mostly a temptation of lack, um, some temptation of disappointment, whichever one that comes. And when they come, the common um, answer that God has given me I'm sure of us have to overcome this, I do very often, is to count my blessings. I, I know we all say this, but it's important to do this because what I do is this. I recount what God has done for me, how far God has brought me, what God has done for me in the past. So thinking about this, makes you more grateful and um, the joy that comes at that moment overcomes every temptation that has been there. So it's important to count for a blessing. No matter what you're going through or no matter what the error present before you, if you remember what God has done in the past for you, how far God has led you, where God has brought you, I mean, it's something to be joyful about. That's wonderful, and that hither, hitherto the Lord hath helped me, and hitherto he will. He will. Yes. So remember, all of this, this is seeking our happiness and soul, and it's wonderful, and you'll find your, your joy and happiness is much more permanent, as is, is said. It won't be fluctuating. It, it'll be there always for you. And what's the greatest thing? I mean, you know, people often say that's one of the most important things. Because with your joy comes every other good thing as well. Um, I'm, I think I'll switch over now to questions and answers. There's a lot more to soul, and I'm going to end on soul. But anyway, if, if you need to know more about soul, on page 75 on questions and answers, there is a question about soul and body and the difference that Mrs. Eddy makes addressing old theology, that soul with a capital S means God, and the other soul is, is not, well, the small s is, is more the physical senses. But yesterday I brought up something about Simeon and his mother, who was Leah, uh, Jacob's second choice. And Simeon, we were discussing, was a very angry man. Um, and we talked a little bit about prenatal influences. And I, I just wanted to go over today on page 71 in questions and answers. Um, could someone read the question and the first two paragraphs? Um, anyone prepared quickly with that, or shall I call it? I think I can do it. OK, it's, it's the middle. Does Christian science set aside? In the first two paragraphs. Yes, Does thank Christian you. science set 
set aside the law of transmission, prenatal desires, and good or bad influences on the unborn child. Science never averts law, but supports it. All actual causation must interpret omnipotence, the all-knowing mind. Law brings out truth, not error, unfolds divine principle, but neither human hypothesis nor matter. Errors are based on a mortal or material formation. They are suppositional modes, not the factors of divine presence and power. Whatever is humanly conceived is a departure from divine law. Hence, its mythical origin and certain end. According to the scriptures, St. Paul declares astutely, For of him and through him and to him are all things. Man is incapable of originating. Nothing can be formed apart from God, good, the all-knowing mind. What seems to be of human origin is the counterfeit of the divine. Even human concepts, mortal shadows, flitting across the the dial of time. Thank you. So this is a treatment for simians (laughs) and any other simians you might know. If someone seems just like a miserable mortal and has had a miserable background and all of this stuff, this is the answer to it. It's not the truth. God didn't create it. God's creations are the unfolding of mind, and it's all good. And this is how you would handle it, just as the, you know, when the, they would ask Jesus, who did sin, this man or his parents? And, and Jesus said, neither. I want you to know that the healing thought to this, so we make sure we don't leave it in the negative. It's not the truth, neither the um uh, upset parents or the the background that the child was conceived in or the miserable life the child seems to be having you have to you have to know the truth about it and and uh, understand that god's creation is good and only good and in this way you can correct the false picture okay who will read the last two paragraphs I'll read it. Okay. Whatever is real is right and eternal. Hence, the immutable and just law of science that God is good only and can transmit to man in the universe nothing evil or unlike himself. For the innocent babe to be born a lifelong sufferer because of his parents' mistakes or sins were sore injustice. Science sets aside man as a creator and unfolds the eternal harmonies of the only living and true origin, God. According to the beliefs of the flesh, both good and bad traits of the parents are transmitted to their helpless offspring, and God is supposed to impart to man this fatal power. It is cause for rejoicing that this belief is as false as it is remorseless. The immutable word saith through the prophet Ezekiel, What mean ye that ye use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge? As I live, saith the Lord God, he shall not have occasion any more to use this proverb in Israel. Isn't that absolutely beautiful? I, it just brings tears to my eyes. So, you work with this, you use it. This is the, the truth. Uh, because God said it. Because God said it. <laughs> it will heal people in prison. Maybe it heals someone you know. The truth about God and his child. I'm going to end quickly now, 1937 college. Um, Nick Dal Young speaks about soul and the beauty of soul, as Fairley was talking, talking about. It starts on page 62. 
The one who is demonstrating soul will not seek to do it, but the beauty of his soul will be manifested in his surroundings. Soul particularly stands for the things that beautify human experience and make life more enjoyable. Soul is the word that signifies beauty, happiness, harmony, peace, and so on. There is not an ugly thing in heaven. Not one idea could ever show forth anything less than infinite soul, which means infinite beauty and joy. We will never come into an experience where we cannot see and appreciate beauty, where we will appreciate by thinking a spiritual sense and not have any evidence of that fact. The fact is that the evidence is to accumulate and be more desirable and abiding than it is at present because the kingdom of heaven is the kingdom of beauty. The fact is you cannot demonstrate the kingdom of heaven unless you demonstrate beauty and joy in everything. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. And we will go forth now and have a, have a service filled with the joy and the beauty of soul. Going forth Thank you. to all mankind. You're so welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.